the hike. <laughs> Wasn't that bad? Yeah. What kind of entrance? That's it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I know on behalf of both of the families, the Morans and the Davises, they're grateful that you have been as flexible as everybody else has had to be to come today and celebrate as Brittany gets married to Seth at last. <laughs> and we know the Lord loves to attend weddings, so let's pray and ask Him to be with us today. Father God, we thank you for, first of all, the opportunity to meet for good weather. And most importantly, Lord, we are so grateful to see the day has finally arrived for Seth to claim his bride, and for Brittany to, of her own free heart, Lord, to gladly receive him as her husband. What a beautiful thing it is to see a marriage get started, to see a journey begin, and especially, Lord, when they love you first. And so we ask you to bless this time with your presence. Lord, we pray you'd let it be a blessing to all who come. And just encourage us, Lord, we ask as we watch the two becoming one before you. We pray, Lord, goodness and mercy would follow them all the days of their life. So be with us now, Lord. Bless this time with your presence, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, you may be seated. <coughs> Who gives this woman to be married to this man? I do. Well, Seth, Brittany, no matter how many times they tried to cancel it, <laughs> tried to rearrange the dates, postpone, whatever, you made it. Since you're here to be married, let's look at where it comes from. And by the way, it doesn't come from government. Marriage comes from God. And it's a commitment the two of you are making today before the Lord to walk in the truth of His Word, to love each other, to honor each other, honor each other to cherish till death do you part. So the question comes, where did this idea come from? And as you know from your Bible in Genesis chapter 2, God created the heavens and the earth. Seven times he said it was good. He said even very good. And then Adam was all by himself. And it says in chapter 2, verse 18, The Lord God said, It's not good that man should be alone. I will make a help meet or fitting for him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and he brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. Whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a help, meat, or fitting for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and he closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. There's a lot of bones in your body. You learn that when you break something like a hand or a foot. And he didn't choose a foot bone because a wife is not meant to be a foot servant. He didn't choose a hand bone. You heard this probably in the premarital class. Because he didn't expect a wife to be a handmaiden. Didn't pick a skull bone because she wasn't to rule over him. But a rib. And again, anatomically speaking, it's the closest possible place you can get to your heart on your skeletal system. And he was sending a message. After your walk with him, no one should be closer to your heart than your husband or your wife because you have not asked anyone else to forsake all others and to cleave to you alone. Practically, it means no one deserves more of your kindness, more of your patience, more of your love, more of your respect than your wife or than your husband because that's the one you've asked again to forsake all others. And so it's a very simple message, but it will show itself many ways practically between the two of you. And it's a powerful witness when people see a marriage where people, A, love God, and B, really love their wife or their husband the way God wanted us to. That's where God's glory begins to be shown of the love of a husband and a wife for each other. And so here, he made the woman, and it's custom made is the idea. She's perfect for him. Absolutely. Which means you'll say yes, she'll say no. You'll say up, she says down. You say left, she says right. And that's not something to be threatened by. That's something to take strength in. God is putting the two of you together. You have different gifts, abilities. You see things differently. You perceive things differently. And rather than battle that, learn to take each other's strengths so the two can truly be one and do well. It's not to compete. It's to complete is the idea that God's working on. 
And so he made her, brought her unto the man. And Adam said, and it's emphatic, by the way, in the language, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. He's been out there all day naming animals, and none of them look like him. But then comes Eve, and he was excited. She should be called woman because she was taken out of man. And probably like the two of you, somewhere in a beautiful field, surrounded by this early creation that had yet to fall, that was perfect, they were staring at each other, and God began to speak. He said, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That verse is from where we receive the idea of marriage. It's got three simple things. A man shall leave his father and mother. And that means the relationship the two of you form today is the primary responsibility to your wife, to your husband, to your family that God would give you. And it doesn't mean you don't love your parents or your extended group of friends here, which are a blessing to meet and listen to and pray for you in the back room. You missed it, but it was good. <laughs> It means that they have to understand you now have some new responsibilities because you're forsaking all, the, all others for each other. And so wise is the marriage that takes the time to invest in itself. Time away. Time to sit and listen to each other. The family and the friends and the extended acquaintances are always welcome. But not if they begin to divide the two of you. Then that becomes a problem. And so a man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, he'll become one flesh. The second item of cleaving speaks of glued or permanence, like the disease clave to the bones of Job. And that means that even when you don't understand each other, you're going to stay. You're not going to go back to the roommates or to the family or wherever you would have come from. But even though I don't understand why you're so upset, we're here. And we're going to wait on God and we'll hear each other out and see if we can figure out a right solution to what do we do now. And so permanence is very important to a marriage. And the last part is the two become one flesh. That's a gift you enjoy on your honeymoon to the time to, meant to be enjoyed for a lifetime. And it just might produce a few kids, God willing, <laughs> and then you really see some one flesh. It's pretty amazing. But it's a very simple formula. You will not have good intimacy if you don't have good permanence. There's no trust. You will not have good permanence if you don't have a right forsaking of all others. Because again, there is no relationship. And so it's three simple things, but yet each are essential to a good, strong, healthy marriage. And then the last one, not mentioned directly, it's indirect. It was God who brought them together, just as God brought you guys together, from first dates in the minivan with the clean floor mats that we learned about, <laughs> to all the other activity you guys have done. It was God who always had a plan. And the children that God willing will come for your union, God has a plan for them too. He had to get the two of you together to produce them, just as he got your parents together to produce you. He always has a plan, which means keep him in the midst. Chapter 3 follows chapter 2. You know this. And that's where Adam and Eve fell. They disobeyed one commandment. And suddenly they're in a fallen world as fallen people. But there was one who stayed perfect, and it was the Lord who brought them together. And so when trouble comes, and it will, go to the one who's perfect. Go to the Lord and ask him, what do I do as a husband? What do I do as a wife? How do I honor you? How do I minister to my husband or my wife? And God will help you, and he'll strengthen you for it. So, they were both naked, the man and his wife. They were not ashamed. Interesting, first marriage, love never mentioned. That was in the premarital class too, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Love was never mentioned. What was mentioned is you were making a commitment. And it's the commitment that let love go through spring, as we're in now, summer. But fall will come sometimes, and even winter. But it's a commitment one to another that lets love go through its seasons and gives you something genuine and rich between the two of you. So with that understanding, it is time to state your intent to be married. So Seth, we'll start with you. And you have to let her know this. Do you take Brittany to be your lawfully wedded wife, to live together after God's ordinance of Christian marriage, to be partakers of the grace of life together, forsaking all others, and to cleave to her alone as outlined in God's word? I do. Brittany, do you take Seth to be your lawfully wedded husband, to live together after God's ordinance of Christian marriage, to be partakers of the grace of life together, forsaking all others, and to cleave to Him alone, as outlined in God's Word. I do. This is a good sign. <laughs> in Ephesians chapter 5, and we'll spend just a few minutes here, it lays out for us a number of things about relationships. Interestingly enough, just before you get to chapter 5, you learn, be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. But in chapter 5, verse 18, he says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, 
but be filled with the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit will do such a better job of comforting and helping you. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's a key verse from our premarital class, which you guys again probably heard. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. A godly man is an easy man to trust, respect, and submit to in his decisions. A godly woman is an easy woman to love, to trust, to cover, to lead in your decisions. If you will stay in your walk right with God, it is so much easier in the marriage relationship. But when one steps out of the fear of God into ungodly behavior, fleshly attitudes, or whatever it may be, once one or the other loses the fear of God, the marriage suffers greatly. And so the key for the two of you is maintaining your own walk with God. It's great you discuss things back and forth, but you have to also feed yourselves spiritually. And so, first things first, submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And then, Brittany, wives, you, you know that qualifies for you today? Wives, does that freak you out? Wives, just want to make sure. Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Now, whenever you mention submission, half the room gets upset. Because unfortunately, they've learned some pretty bizarre ideas. We get some calls from time to time out in sort of Western PA. You know, the different Amish lands, some other places are listening. It's kind of odd. But, uh, so we should review this for a minute. Being in submission to your husband, does that mean you don't have a right to have an opinion? No. Yeah, you get to have an opinion, don't you? Does that mean when you make a decision, you don't have a right to have a vote? Oh, no, you get the vote, right? But one thing we try to warn you about is if there's a decision to be made and the two of you have different opinions, who has the final word? The Lord. The Lord. And then the husband. But what's important is you're not a rib. Uh, no, you're not a hand bone. You're not a foot bone. You're not a skull bone. You're a rib, which means you pray for your husband. You tell him what you think. And over time, you guys learn to trust each other in your decision making. Again, if your decisions are made in the fear of God, you usually come out okay. But it is, it's a challenge. And that's why your walk with God is so important to build that trust. So it doesn't mean you don't vote, it doesn't mean you don't have an opinion. And if it goes wrong, it doesn't mean you can't say, I told you so. <laughs> but it does mean today you're receiving Him as your covering and as your head. You guys, fortunately, have had a lot of time to watch each other and grow together. So hopefully, there's not a whole lot of surprises. But the encouragement in Proverbs 14, 1 says, The wise woman builds up her house with her hands. The foolish woman plucks it apart with hers. Same utensils, two different heart attitudes. And so wise is the wife that encourages, prays for, and sometimes in love challenges a husband because a wife behind a man can make all the difference if she roots him on but speaks truth to him in love. So very important in your walk. And then also it says, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, Seth, that applies to you today in about 10 minutes. <laughs> Love your wives. And if we stop there, you'd be like, got it covered, Pastor Chris. <laughs> Love your wives. I'm all over this. I'm good. But he qualified it. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. How did he give himself for the church? He died for her. When you know the difference, it can be a challenge to be in submission sometimes. But to know your job is to die to yourself, to take care of her, it's a harder challenge. He died for her. He went on and he said that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Wise is the husband who knows God's word. It'll direct your path. It'll keep you guys straight where you need to be with him. It'll help you know how to raise your own descendants, your kids, as well as make godly decisions. But if you don't know the word, it's awfully hard for the family to know the word. That's something that's key for you. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. What that means practically is you look out for her. I've sat with wives in meetings when there's something going on. And they'll say, I wish my husband would look out for me. And guys, that doesn't mean, look out, here comes my wife. It means, I wish he would care for me, consider my needs, and help me. And that's all about dying yourself. Bath time for kids, reading stories to them, helping her when you can see she needs, the dishes need to be done, something needs to be just, you just 
put on the apron, man, and serve. And you'll say, well, I don't see a lot of people do that. Well, I know in your home you do, but you don't see it in a lot of homes. But if you'll do that, you'll be the most blessed guy in your neighborhood, apartment complex, or wherever you're living, because she'll know that my husband cares for me. Trust me, you'll be a happy man. It's a good thing. So men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. No man yet ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord, the church. For we, God's people, are members of his body, of his flesh, and his bones. And so for this cause, once again, a man shall leave his father and mother, shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. And wait a minute, we can review. It was separation, permanence, intimacy. Why is it now a mystery in the New Testament? He answers it. He says, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now, this is actually a really great illustration because normally I have to hypothetically do this. But had the car kept driving <laughs> and not let Brittany out, would you be married? No. no. Right. If she came forward and I say, Brittany, do you receive Seth to be your lawfully wedded husband? She said, you know, I'm not sure about that. I only know the historic Seth or I don't know if Seth could really be a husband, probably just a good guy. Would you be married? No. You see, when we walked out, you made the offer very clear you are willing to receive a bride. Okay, so you were basically saying your I do's by your action. Wonderful. You coming forward and saying I do showed your intent of your own free will to receive him as your husband. You guys are the object lesson. God so loved the world. He's already been waiting, making the offer to anyone who would come and ask his forgiveness. We, like the bride, have to surrender our will, come forward and say, Lord, will you forgive me of my sins? And his answer is, I do. That's why marriage is under such heavy attack, because the love between a husband and a wife is supposed to show the love of God to his church and the love of the church to God. Friendship, companionship, yes, even intimacy, but in the spirit. It's a picture of Christ and his church. And so your marriage actually can do a lot of witnessing just by how you treat each other. Never underestimate a healthy marriage and the testimony you can have among a world that is just so hurting and messed up to see the fear of God between you, the love of God between you, and the idea that even when we make mistakes, to be loved anyway, what an amazing relationship to have. And it's just a taste of heaven. So this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, that be you, Seth, even as himself, and let the wife see that she reverence her husband. So with that understanding, it is time to exchange your vows. Seth, you're going to go first. You'll repeat after me to her, please. I, Seth, I, Seth. Take you, Brittany. Take you, Brittany. To be my lawfully wedded wife. To be my lawfully wedded wife. <laughs> to have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better or worse. For better or worse. For richer or poor. For richer or poor. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love. To love. Honor. Honor. And cherish. And cherish. Till death do us part. Brittany, it's your turn. I, Brittany. I, Brittany. Take you, Seth. Take you, Seth. Be my lawfully wedded husband. Be my lawfully wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better or worse. For better or worse. For richer or poorer. For richer or poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love. To love. Honor. Honor. And cherish. And cherish. Till death do us part. Till death do us part. Ben, I believe you're going to read for us. out of Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 through 12. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he who has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, by another two can withstand him, and threefold cord is not quickly broken. I think we're going to worship the Lord. Thank you. 
it's time to see if your hand will fit in that pocket. <laughs> well, not early for you. There you go. So the rings that you guys are going to exchange are a reminder of the covenant that you've made today, these vows and the things you spoke even earlier to each other. And as you know, through the word, God will use signs of covenants, the rainbow in the heavens, from Noah, the flood. They sound strange, but the covenantal sign that Abraham throughout his day reminded that God had changed his heart and that he believed the Lord. And the ultimate example is the night when Jesus was betrayed and he would take the bread and the cup. And he'd say, take this, each of you eat it. It's my body broken for you and then drink this cup, it's my blood. The new covenant promised in Jeremiah, promised in Ezekiel, promised in Malachi, finally fulfilled. If we would simply like a bride, humble ourselves, come and ask forgiveness or ask to be joined to the Lord who offers to all. And so this reminder when you're doing the dishes or bathing kids or going to work or wherever you're gonna be, when you see these rings, your rings are Seth's promise to you, your ring is Brittany's promise to you, of the things you guys have assumed or have assured each other today that you would do for each other. So you get to go first. And I don't know which one of those you pick, so you get two on this one. It's a double. If you would repeat after me, I give you this ring. I give you this ring. As a reminder of the covenant. As a reminder of the covenant. We have made here today. We've made here today. And to remind you. And to remind you. Of the unending love. Of the unending love. God has given me. God has given me. For you. All right, Brittany, here we go. If you would repeat this after me, give this to Seth. I give you this ring. Yeah, I give you this ring. As a token of the covenant. As a token of the covenant. We've made here today. We've made here today. And to remind you. And to remind you. Of the never-ending love. The never-ending love. God has given me. God has given me. For you. For you. We would like the parents to come and pray for their children as they fully understand the journey you're beginning. Barkley, you want to lead us off? Sure. <laughs> Sorry, you guys go ahead. We're secure. Exactly. <laughs> Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for Amen. Amen. Thank you. So is it strange that was your last hug and kiss as single people? Because we're here now. It says, love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Love vaunts not itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave itself unseemingly. Love seeks not her own. Love is not easily provoked. Love thinketh no evil. Love rejoices not in iniquity, but love rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Love believeth all things. Love hopeth all things. Love endures all things. Love never fails. Well, Seth, Brittany, because you have exchanged your vows and covenants before these friends, your parents, family members, and before the Lord, by the authority that's invested in me as a servant of Jesus Christ, I now pronounce you husband and wife, and you may kiss your bride. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to present to you Mr. and Mrs. Seth Davis.
Just a sec. Sorry, I'm having trouble with the connection. Please try again in a moment. <laughs> 